Incinerating and slicing your way through hordes of enemies is an exhilarating and engaging approach to crushing content in Lords of the Fallen. Combining this with the ability to continuously ignite and detonate explosions that engulf your enemies in a relentless inferno of hellfire whilst maintaining infinite stamina makes this build a number one choice if you want to see your enemies turn to ash in the wake of an infernal surge of destruction. If you want to play as an explosive, unrelenting, inferno-focused melee character that has the ability to detonate explosive chain reactions of near nuclear proportions, all while surging through the battlefield, turning your enemies to ash wearing a grim and ghastly grin, then this spicy concoction is the build for you. Face Shifter here, and thank you for checking out my explosive Grim Reaper build. In today's video, we're breaking down what is, in my opinion, one of the best Burn Ignite builds that has the ability to do consistently high damage whilst maintaining almost permanent uptime, even when out of melee range. We'll be going over the stats, weapons, armor, rings, pendants, and rune choices that make this build a fire obsessed explosive grim reaper with incredibly synergistic mechanics to deploy so without any further ado let's get into it in the early game, the main stats to focus on is Inferno for damage scaling and Vitality for survivability. Initially, you will require around 20 points in Endurance to have ample stamina to utilize in the early to mid game. My advice here would be to get Inferno to 75 and Vitality to 40, then fill in the rest in any order of your choosing. It should be noted that this build focuses on using two grinning axes, which scale with Inferno only. Another option for those of you that don't have access to the second axe is using Bloodlust. This weapon scales with Inferno and Agility, so you may want to consider spreading your points more equally between these two stats if this is the route that you choose. You can, of course, just use one grinning axe if you'd also prefer. My final stat points are now on the screen. I chose to stat 60 into Vitality for more life, and Radiance got some love as it gives resistance and increased mana, which supports the frequent casting of buff sorceries. If you're a min-maxer, I would recommend starting with the Pirate Cultist due to the fact that they begin with 18 Inferno. For the primary weapon, I am dual-wielding grinning axes. This choice centers around three factors. Firstly, this setup allows for a very quick and fluid playstyle with interesting movesets. Secondly, it offers rapid buildup of burn and ignite status effects, especially with the correct rune, ring, pendant and umbral eye combinations. And finally, the weapons use a combination of fire and wither damage, which makes our damage output focus primarily on elemental damage, again opening up some really interesting interactions when considering our rune and umbral eye choices. As previously explained, you may choose to wield one of these until you get your hands on a second one, or you can combine it with the Bloodlust Short Sword in the meantime. Just make sure that you factor in that Bloodlust can also scale off a Agility along with Inferno. This can be acquired from the chest in the area where you fight Crimson Rector Percival. We cover all things ARPG and FPS on this channel, so if you enjoy games like Lords of the Fallen, consider subscribing or joining the channel. We currently have a returning viewer base of 10,000 people, which is absolutely awesome. With 1,250 subscribers, that means 8,750 of you still haven't smashed that sub button. With that in mind, I'm also pleased to announce that channel memberships are now live, and another way that you can support the channel and the Face Shift community. There are three different tiers which offer you perks, such as playing cooperative with me during streams if the game allows it, access to the Face Shift community Discord, and early access to some videos. Either way, whether you join the channel or subscribe, if you're enjoying the content, it really helps me out, and this interdimensional community welcomes you with open arms. Drop a like if you enjoy the video, and sound off in the comments below with any thoughts and questions. Now, back to the weapons. The Grinning Axe can be acquired in Castle Bramis, as indicated in the footage you're now watching, and it's fairly straightforward to get. The only thing that I would say is, you get this weapon quite late on in the game, so if it's your first playthrough and you haven't yet got one, it might be better to look at something like Bloodlust or something else that's Inferno based just to be a little placeholder until that point folks. The three rune slots in this weapon are integral to the functionality of the build. Any combination of Trellis, Shon and Sabino runes can be combined to fine tune a balance between the speed of the status buildups, elemental damage output and life leech on hit. I personally opt to go with one Trellis and two Shon runes in each weapon, as I feel that Sabino's life on here isn't worth it if you're making sure you play with finesse to avoid taking damage where possible. It should also be noted that you can only get one Shon rune per playthrough, and this will therefore have an impact on the choices of rune that you may select. You could also choose for increased fire damage from a Tiernarx rune, or opt for De Halwi for further increased Inferno attribute scaling in the meantime. The choice is entirely yours. In terms of rings and pendants, our pendant of choice is the pendant of Infernal Ablation. This increases our damage to targets which are burning, and based on our next ring choices on the rune setup, this will be very often indeed. The ring choices are very straightforward. A ring of Infernal Devotion, which creates an interaction where inflicting burn buildup simultaneously inflicts ignite buildup, and a ring of 
wildfire, which ensures that when an enemy is damaged by the explosion from Ignite, it becomes burn. So, with the rapid application of burn and Ignite from our weapons and rune choices, this synergizes perfectly with this trio of items. What you're then left with is an incredibly high damaging, fast attacking, explosive prop machine that's very satisfying to play. However, there is another interaction which really is the icing on the proverbial cake here, folks. If you socket the umbral eye of the bloody pilgrim into our main lamp socket, we gain an effect which means light attacks deal bonus damage, but they only deal with a damage. So in essence, when we perform a light attack, we do approximately 20% more damage than we would have done previously, with the caveat that all the damage is instead rolled into wither damage. Now, usually this would be fairly useless, as you need to find another method of causing damage to an enemy to remove the withered health. However, because we have set this build up to continuously proc explosions, and because the wildfire ring interacts with ignite, ensuring that once an enemy is ignited, they are also burned, this wither health literally is instantly removed and burnt away, essentially giving us a free increase of 20% damage. This is also useful because the grinning axes themselves also do wither damage, so this setup is really running a complementary array of gear. In terms of catalysts, I'm using Queen Sophia's catalyst, as our investment is purely inferno-based. At plus 10, this comes with S-tier inferno scaling, and the spell power is just shy of 700, and it also has five spell slots, a simply sublime choice here. You can acquire this from completing the Tortured Prisoners quest line, so if you're looking for other options, the other three inferno catalysts will do just fine. Rogue's Heart, Searing Accusation, or Miranda's Touch are all viable. Starting with the Pirate Cultist is also beneficial here, as you'll start with a solid inferno catalyst to sling spells with. Speaking of spells, our spells are what really tie this build together. The first four choices are pretty set in stone. We use three Adir Shout Sorceries. Number one, Adir's Endurance, which gives us an insanely quick stamina regen, which ensures we are able to sustain our onslaught of attacks consistently, which keeps the continuous Ignite procs flowing. This can be acquired from Damaros during her quest line. Once you give her the Adir's Worshipper's Saw during an infernal ending playthrough, so definitely avoid extinguishing any torches if you want this one, folks. Our second choice is Adir's Rage. According to the Fextra Life Wiki, this gives us a flat 10% damage increase for 90 seconds, and upon testing, I do believe this to be accurate. This is again acquired from Damaros during a quest line for the infernal ending. Our third choice is Adir's Hardiness. This gives us a flat 25% damage reduction for 90 seconds, an incredibly powerful spell, particularly for those of us who like to play Lords of the Fashion and value style points over defensive stats. This is located in the Bell Room doorway next to the Bell Room waypoint. Once you've reached the arena where you fight the Bell of Tenacity boss, follow the staircase on the left, and with a bit of searching, you'll find a door that can only be opened with the Pilgrim's Perch key. The spell is in the chest in there. Our fourth spell choice is Infernal Weapon. This imbues our weapon with even more fire damage and synergizes really well with the previously mentioned aspects of the build. It also completes the build's aesthetic and ensures the explosive Grim Reaper truly lives up to its name. Our fifth spell slot is Flexible. I use Infernal Guardian most of the time. This summons a fire spirit that launches bolts of fire at your enemies intermittently and adds another layer of safety when you're trying to remove chunks of wither damage that you're doing through the Umbral Eye interaction discussed earlier. You could also swap this out for range spells such as Lava Burst or Infernal Orb if you'd like to add a more ranged element to your gameplay style. The choice again is entirely up to you. For all my Lords of the Fashion heads, here are your armor choices. If you're interested in the way this character looks, I'm using the Pirate Cultist hood with the Oathbreaker tint, the Carrion Knight armor, Pure Blade gloves, and Holy Bulwark trousers. And these are all colored with the Justice CR tint. The mechanics of this build are very straightforward to play. Buff yourself with all three shout sorceries, imbue your weapon with Infernal Weapon, cast Infernal Guardian, and pop a Mana Cluster and a Brio Stone for good measure. Select your target, and then try to make sure that your attacks get in there first if you can. Ignite procs can often stagger enemies, and you can wind up stun locking your targets. If you get into this cycle, you're absolutely golden. If you're fighting groups, try and pick targets that will allow for the Ignite procs to overlap one another. This yields the best DPS output, and again, staggers opponents for fun. It's very satisfying watching mobs falling around the place, disintegrating to ash. If you don't land a stagger, be defensive and wait for those windows of opportunity to appear. This build works best if you think of it like a burst damage playstyle. It doesn't face tank and does require you to be defensive sometimes. The same approach should be taken with bosses. Focus on getting the ignites to proc and be confident knowing that once they're burning, you can chip them down with Infernal Guardian or your other ranged attack and do big damage when you hit them during those time damage window openings. So, there we have it, folks. An explosive Grin Reaper to disintegrate and blow your enemies to pieces with a relentless whirlwind of frenzied elemental axe swings.
Assassinating your enemies with a hail of holy bolts and cinder arrows is a highly effective and satisfying method of destruction in Lords of the Fallen. Combining this with the ability to maintain infinite ammo and a steady influx of HP makes this a nightmare for even the tankiest of mobs throughout your playthroughs. If you want to play as a high damaging, sharp shooting, HP leeching, agility focused range character that has the ability to decimate single targets and clear rooms full of mobs in the blink of an eye, all whilst fulfilling the demon hunter aesthetic, then this, my friends, is the build for you. Shifter here, and thank you for checking out my Merciless Demon Hunter build. In today's video, we're breaking down what is, in my opinion, one of the best range builds that has the ability to do incredibly high damage at range, all whilst leeching a steady flow of life and maintaining a permanent bank of infinite ammunition. We'll be going over the stats, weapons, armor, rings, pendants, and rune choices that make this build a ruthless, devastating demon hunter that rivals most builds' damage output. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. The main stats to focus on in this build are agility and strength for damage scaling and vitality for survivability. As this build focuses on using crossbows and bows, we need to ensure that the majority of our points focus on maximizing our DPS output through this means of attack. Initially, you'll require around 20 points in endurance to have ample stamina to utilize in the early to mid game. My advice here would be to get agility to 75 and strength to around 50, then fill in the rest in any order of your choosing. You'll gain damage from starting into agility and strength and more HP from vitality. I aim for around 40 initially here. For the primary weapon, I'm wielding either the Harrower Dervler's crossbow or the Defiled Infantry. Bow. The choice between these centers around your choice of play style. The crossbow fires three shots per volley and causes utter devastation. Caveat to this is that the interaction with the Umbral Eye of Lydia the Numb Witch is that it causes a lot of life to be lost when we misplace any shots. This also counts for when you've killed an enemy and the final bolt or two therefore miss. This may mean that some of you prefer the bow, which also offers extremely solid single damage output and is a completely viable choice here. I personally prefer the crossbow as you can offset this HP loss by slotting the correct runes and being a little bit more dexterous with the analog stick to ensure that you switch targets mid volley. Crossbow itself can be acquired when you gain the remembrance of Harrow Dervler, and the bow can be acquired down in Lower Kalrath. We cover all things ARPG and FPS on this channel, so if you enjoy games like Lords of the Fallen, consider subscribing or joining the channel. We currently have a returning viewer base of 10,000 people, which is absolutely awesome. With 1,250 subscribers, that means 8,750 of you still haven't smashed that sub button. With that in mind, I'm also pleased to announce that channel memberships are now live, and another way that you can support the channel and the face shift community. There are three different tiers which offer you perks, such as playing cooperatively with me during streams if the game allows it, access to the Phase Shift community discord, and early access to some videos. Either way, whether you join the channel or subscribe, if you're enjoying the content, it really helps me out and this interdimensional community welcomes you with open arms. Drop a like if you enjoy the video and sound off in the comments below with any thoughts and questions. Now, back to the weapons. The main and offhand weapon choice is a dual wielding Jeffrey's daggers. This will require you to do two playthroughs or get a friend to drop you one in order to get the second. These can be located by dropping off the bridge by the Tower of Penance. The reason for this choice of dagger is very simple. When fully upgraded, it has three meta rune slots which allow us to slot any choice of rune into these weapons. The three rune slots in this weapon are integral to the functionality of the build. Any combination of Aelstrix and Tumul runes can be combined to fine-tune a balance between DPS output for ranged weapons and life leech on kill. I opt to go for two Aelstrix runes and one Tumul in each dagger to slightly favour increased damage output whilst allowing us to maintain a healthy life sustain. In terms of rings and pendants, our pendant of choice is the Princess's Sting. This grants us a flat 12.5% damage increase if we keep our weight to light encumbrance. Whilst this costs us physical protection, it improves our DPS and offers us a challenging addition to our usual Lords of the Fashion approach. The ring choices are very straightforward. A ring of bones to increase the encumbrance level and a black feather ranger ring to increase our ranged attack damage work effectively here. You can of course remove the ring of bones if you'd rather not maintain light encumbrance, but this also means that you no longer have the real purpose for Princess's Sting. The choice is yours. You could also, of course, then use two Black Feather Ranger Rings to increase your range damage that might offset that a little bit. It's entirely up to you and how you want to play the game. In terms of the bolts that I use, if I'm using the crossbow, I primarily use twisted bolts for massive single target and AoE damage. I rarely find myself changing from these, even in areas where mobs have holy resistance. I do have Cinder Bolts and Radiant Bolts on Switch here, just to add a bit of variety, but I rarely find myself equipping them. In terms of arrows, if I'm using using the Defiled Infantry Bow. I mainly use Cinder Arrows, but I also have Weighted and Radiant Arrows to add a little bit of variety again here as well for those moments where fire resilient mobs in particular are causing me problems. Now, I know a lot of you are really interested in achieving those coveted style points in Lords of the Fashion. So if you're interested in the way this character looks, I'm using the Neophyte Hood, Harrower Armor, Dispair's Grasps, and Black Feather Ranger Trousers. These are all colored with the Harbinger Tinct. This build is incredibly straightforward to play. 
Buff yourself with bleed salts and unripened berries. Position yourself favorably and unleash a relentless volley of bolts or arrows into your enemies. If you're firing at a group when using the crossbow, be sure to flick the stick either left or right to ensure that you spread your shots around so you don't lose any life due to the umbral eye interaction. It should also be noted that this build is not a tank build. It does rely on some finesse, especially when you're playing Lords of the Fashion and not maximizing your armor statistics. So, there we have it, folks. A merciless demon hunter to assassinate and terrorize your enemies with a relentless barrage of elemental life leeching bolts and arrows. Obliterating your enemies with devastating umbral magic is one of the most satisfying ways to enjoy your time in Lords of the Fallen. Combining this with the ability to maintain a steady flow of life leech ensures you are a highly resilient scourge of destruction. If you want to play as a vampiric, HP leeching melee caster hybrid that can turn its hand to favour either approach in equal measure, has the ability to dispatch enemies from afar, break stagger bars and even administer those bloodthirsty grievous strikes, all whilst fulfilling the blood-sucking Lovecraftian vampire aesthetic, then this this is the build for you. Face Shifter here, and thank you for checking out my Undying Umbral Vampire build. In today's video, we're breaking down what is, in my opinion, one of the best melee caster builds that has a specialism in life leeching at both range and in close quarters combat to keep ourselves sustained. We'll be going over the stats, weapons, armor, rings, pendants, and rune choices that make this build an undying, blood-sucking umbral menace that's difficult to contend with. We cover all things ARPG and FPS on this channel, so if you enjoy games like Lords of the Fallen, consider subscribing to the channel. The community would love to have you. Drop a like if you enjoy the video and sound off in the comments below with any thoughts and questions. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. In the early game, the main stats to focus on in this build are Inferno and Radiance for damage scaling and Vitality for survivability. As the build focuses on dual wielding Bloodlust, we only require 13 points in agility to ensure we can use them. The rest can then go into our main stats. Initially, you'll require around 20 points in Endurance to have ample stamina to utilize in the early to mid game. My advice here would be to get Inferno to around 70 and Radiance to around 50 50, and then fill the rest in in any order of your choosing. You'll gain damage from statting into Radiance and Inferno and more HP from Vitality. The Orion Preacher and the Orion Preacher Hammer are, as usual, your best choice of starting class and weapon due to the 18 points of Radiant damage the class starts with and the fact it has an absolute beast of a weapon in the early to mid game. For the primary weapon, I am dual wielding Bloodlust Short Swords. This choice is underpinned by two reasons. First of all, when delivering a final hit via a melee attack or spell, these swords have a life leeching effect. Wielding two also stacks this effect. Secondly, the rune slots allow us to use a total of four tumble runes to further enhance our vampiric life leeching effect when we kill enemies. This weapon also comes with 60 bleed and 60 burn in the status effects department. Combining this with bleed salts further emphasizes this effect and also allows us to further lean into the undying umbral vampire kind of look. This can be acquired from the chest in the area where you fight Crimson Rector Percival and you'll need to complete two playthroughs or find a willing friend to drop you a second one to complete this build. For those of you with only one bloodlust, this build still works, albeit with a slightly diminished return on the life leech. You could try another weapon to dual wield, or go with a shield and some Tumul or Nartan runes for either mana or HP regeneration. The three rune slots in this weapon are integral to the functionality of the build. Two Tumul runes are non-negotiable to further improve our life leeching capabilities. When dual wielding two bloodlust with two Tumul runes, we leech around 90 HP per kill. The final rune slot is an agility slot, and you'll have a number of choices here. You could go with Vixis runes for increased bleed buildup, or you could go with Demexus, which increases physical damage whilst dual wielding. Ornix for increased Grievous Strike damage or Nelkrune for those choosing to Vigor Farm. I opt to go for Vixis to maximize how quickly bleed builds up to stay with the theme of blood and vampires, but all these options are completely viable, folks. In terms of catalysts, the best in slot choice here for this build is the Los Barescu's Catalyst. At plus 10, this provides us with exceptional spell power that is just shy of 800, and it also has A tier Radiance and Inferno scaling with five spell slots, a simply superb choice here. This is acquired in the Revelation Depths via an Umbral Belly. In terms of rings and pendants, our pendant of choice is the Pendant of Atrophy. This pendant allows us to continue to spam cast Umbral spells even when we've depleted our mana. This makes it very easy to spam enemies down with a barrage of Umbral Devastation. The ring choices are also very straightforward. A barrage route and a puissance route provide us with increased damage to our sorceries with the barrage route removing one spell slot as a penalty which leaves us with four instead of five. This is completely workable and not a problem at all for this build. You can also double down on either ring with Barrage Root being the most desirable for those who want the highest DPS increase possible and at the cost of two spell slots being removed. Speaking of spamming Umbral spells, our main source of range damage comes from Latimer's Javelin. This can be acquired from the Remembrance of the Hush Saint. This thing hits like an absolute truck 
and offers both single target and AoE damage output. I've seen this thing hit numbers of around 1.8k per throw, and I'm not even maxed out on damage stats, but from what I've read and seen, apparently this can hit up to around 2.5k if you have both your Radiance and your Inferno stats maxed out. This is in combination with the Pendant of Atrophy, and it makes it absolutely insane for anyone favouring the caster approach. It also works well in combination with melee attacks as a way to chip the mob's health and posture down before they even reach you. The second spell is Diminishing Missile, which sends a homing projectile of Umbral Magic that debuffs an enemy by reducing their attack damage and their defences. Another highly viable and useful choice here. Our third choice of spell is Umbral Agony. This fires a slow-moving orb of Umbral Energy that deals large chunks of damage to foes and takes huge chunks of stagger bars off. You can cast this at your enemy's feet or at walls nearby to ensure that it explodes, dealing solid AoE damage to multiple enemies. It's excellent for breaking stagger bars if you're the sort of player that likes to look to run in and finish enemies off with Grievous Strikes for those extra style points. Our fourth slot is flexible. I go with either Barrage of Echoes for extremely tasty burst damage or Painful Echo, which sends a bolt of umbral energy that bounces and chains between enemies. This is down to your personal preference, and I tend to swap between these two spells to keep things fresh. Now, I know a lot of you like to know how we complete the character looks. So in this case, I'm using the Grace of a Deer Mask Helm. I'm using the Crimson Rector Armor, the Crimson Rector Leggings, and the Lord's Gauntlets. And all of these are colored with the Cell Sword tinked. The mechanics of this build are very simple. Buff up with Bleed Salts, favorably position yourself, cast a Bolt of Diminishing Missile, and begin spamming whichever skills you see fit. Latimer's Javelin has excellent range and damage. The projectile also moves pretty quickly too, which makes this my most favored choice. You can situationally use the other spells, and I usually throw a cast or two of Barrage of Echoes at my feet as enemies approach, with what is left of the HP and Stagger Bar then being melted. I then either dispatch them with a well-timed attack, or administer a Vampiric Life Leech in Grievous Strike. The build can be played as a full caster, or a combination of melee and caster, and both styles allow us to gain 90 HP per kill, which makes us very difficult to kill in return. It should be noted that this is not a tank build. It does rely on some finesse, especially if you're playing Lords of the Fashion and not maximizing your armor statistics. So, there we have it folks, an undying Umbral Vampire to devastate and drain your enemies with a relentless barrage of Umbral Destruction and Bloodthirsty Life Leeching. A massive thank you for the continued support you've been giving the channel. This interdimensional community is steadily increasing in size, and it's been great to see some of the same faces appearing in the comments. The comment section has been really insightful and constructive, and I'm really enjoying engaging with you. So, with that in mind, if you want to see more content of this nature, please do smash that like button and subscribe to the channel to support share this with your friends put it wherever you want it really does help the channel grow so until next time take care of yourselves enjoy the build and i'll see you in the next one guys